Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Brandenstein. I'm the pastor here at Grace and Peace, and I uh, just want to welcome you all here to this event. It's, we're really excited to have a Carver event here at Grace and Peace, um, and we look forward to hopefully having more. So uh, um, we hope you get to, get to return for one of these. Uh, one of the things that uh, Grace and Peace, as you, if you stick around after the talk tonight, we have a gallery behind us. And uh, Grace and Peace has always been uh, a church that has a uh, love for the arts. And Nancy Hughes, our art curator, has uh, brought in a show that will be starting. We have a show right now that's going to be ending. It's uh, photographs of couples who have been married over 30 years. And you can see all those pictures, all those photographs that are hung up all around in the gallery and in the hallway. Um, but that'll be closing out this week. But starting on March 25th, which is Palm Sunday, we're going to be opening a show by artist Sandra Bowden, who is, uh, this, this is called Via Crucis, and it is, was, she describes delicate translations of icons of the Western, of Western art. So they are uh, crucifixes and crosses that, that she has interpreted with gold leaf and some pencil drawing as well, and they're really beautiful, and some of those will be set up in the gallery when you gather this evening. So please take some time to, to look at that, and once the, the show opens up, you feel free to come on and uh, take a look at it on Sunday as well. Well, before we get started, I'd like to open us in prayer, and then I want to introduce John Hendricks, who will introduce Dr. Whitebrook. Father God, we thank you so much for your gathering us together tonight. We thank you for the arts and Lord, you've created us to be creators. You've created us to behold beauty and to love beauty. And I pray that tonight you would give us a new perspective, that you would help us to see the things that we have been perhaps um, blinded to, perhaps the things that we have just not thought to look at. I pray that you would give us new eyes tonight. And Lord, direct us to see your creation and your people more in the way that you have created us to see one another. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to introduce John Hendricks, who's going to come up and introduce tonight's event. Hello. You know you're in the academy when there are introductions to introductions. Uh, <laughs> I'm John Hendricks, member of the Carver Project. Uh, if you don't know about the Carver Project, we are a group of Christian faculty at WashU, and we work to empower our students uh, to serve and connect university, church, and society. So that's what we hope we're doing here tonight. So, okay, bear with me. I have a few things we have to tell you about. Uh, really great things coming up with the Carver Project. If you got one of these on your way out, just a few events you might want to come to. Gary Schmidt, if you have ever read Wednesday Wars, uh, one of the real heroes uh, in the kid lit genre. March 26th, uh, he will be speaking on writing as a sacramental act. And then every year, our sort of big event for Carver is the Carver Conversation. April 26th, that'll be at The Gathering, uh, with three really interesting speakers that we put in dialogue together. Uh, Phil Vischer, uh, otherwise known as Bob the Tomato from VeggieTales, uh, Dan Nyeri, and uh, Trillia Newbell, uh, authors, writers, makers. And they're going to be talking on the topic of childlike faith and how you translate the gospel into art and story for all ages. So I'll be moderating that conversation and I'm very excited for you to meet these folks. They are uh, wonderful people and also very, very, very funny. Okay, if you have a question tonight, if you have this, there's a little QR code here you can scan and send a question into our uh, The Magic Brain somewhere and Luis is gonna give me those questions at the end of the talk and then I'll give those uh, at the end for, for public discussion. Finally, before I introduce Dr. Wipro, we have some of her books back here. Uh, Kelly from Subterranean Books, uh, she has long supported the Carver Project. Really hope you can help her prevent her taking these very heavy books back to her car. So please do buy one and uh, uh, there will be signings um, in the gallery afterwards. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alyssa Wipro. She went to Covenant College where she got her BA in Interdisciplinary Studies in 2004. And then she came to St. Louis to get her MA and eventually her PhD in Art History, 
culminating in 2013. And then she returned to join the faculty at Covenant College, where she is an associate professor of art and art history. So uh, you are all really in for a treat tonight. So please welcome Dr. Wiper. Great, thank you all for being here and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really sweet to be able to come back to St. Louis, a city that we really loved um, or still love and are sad that we're not here. Um, and to be able to come back and to sort of revisit old places um, and old art has been really, really a joy. So thank you. Questions when we started attending a new church. Um, and, you know, some of you um, are, are probably familiar with this pattern, right? So they find out that you're here for graduate school and they want to be nice and generous. And so they say, um, well, what kind of art do you study? And again, some of you may have either been on the giving or receiving end of first year graduate students trying to explain what it is that they are interested in. And it comes out something like this, right? <laughs> Just no sense whatsoever. And so my husband got really good at offering a better explanation of what it was that I was studying. <laughs> and he would say, well, you know when you go to the art museum and there's that whole section that you are not even sure if it's art? Yeah, that stuff. Alyssa studies the art you don't like. And then everybody would immediately know what he was talking about. And then we would move on to a different kind of conversation altogether. <laughs> And, and here's the thing, is that he wasn't wrong, right? Because if you were expecting a beautiful Rembrandt painting or a masterful Bernini sculpture, and you found out that I was studying lines on a canvas or maybe a crouching figure made of wax, you might be let down too and think, yes, these are things that I too do not like. You may be wondering where the truth, beauty, and goodness could possibly be in something like this. And maybe, I'm not sure, I was trying to, to, to think about this in advance, but when I was probably in, my, in the middle of my time in graduate school, I actually really liked this stuff, and I started not liking things like this, right? So this is Thomas Dewing's Woman in White at the, um, at the St. Louis Art Museum. And this kind of soft focus sentimentality seemed like lowest common denominator art to me, just like very boring. Why would I want to look at something like this? So I need your help because before I continue, I wanna make sure that I am talking about art that you particularly do not like, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna assume that most people here are not huge fans of the, the Mondrian on the left-hand side, the painting. So regardless of how you feel about it, I'm talking about that one, sorry. <laughs> but which, we're gonna have a voting. Which one of these do we like less as a group? Okay, and you can vote, you can vote twice. We're just trying to get general consensus of what we don't like here. Okay, and John's gonna help me determine so that I'm just not choosing which one I wanna talk about. I'm gonna uh, <laughs> so if you do not like the sculpture on the left, if you're thinking that's gross, I really do not like the sculpture on the left, please raise your hand. Okay, and if you're thinking, I really don't like that painting on the right, that's kind of boring, that's kind of awful, um, you can raise your hand for that one. I really wanted, I really wanted that sculpture. But. Okay, so okay, so it's the it's the Thomas Dewing. Yeah. It's the one on the right. Okay, oh. let me excise something from my notes real quick. <laughs> okay, so we got. Don't worry. In Q and A, if you want to go back to this other one, we can do that. Okay. So <laughs> here's what I want to do with these artworks. Instead of looking at art to consume it or judge it, to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, what if we actually make something from what we see? Make something from what gives us discomfort or something that we might disdain? As image bearers, we are culture makers, right? 
we, um, when we look at art and images, we can actually do something with them. We're not simply consuming visual information or waiting for a painting to stir our complacent souls, but because we operate from a place of abundance as beloved children of God who believe in the coming restoration of this world, I really believe that our gaze can open up something new, that our looking can be a kind of making, that it can be generative and not just critical, that it can lead to doxology, that it might direct us to lament, that it might, as we'll focus on tonight, even open up a path for confession. And in doing so, that art can grow our love for God and for our neighbor. I argue all of this more fully in my book, Redeeming Vision, but tonight, using the artworks that you just helped me decide on, um, I, wanna dis I wanna just dig into one possible kind of response, that of confession. To do this, we need redeeming vision. It's a way of looking that takes embodiment seriously, that is oriented in love, and that is also open to transformation. And these commitments are what prompts us to give appropriate attention to the object itself, to the artist, and to what we ourselves bring to the artwork. And then, I want to argue, we might be able to make something out of it all. So we will start with this painting, um, Pete Mondrian's lozenge composition with yellow, black, blue, red, and gray from 1923. And if you are following along in the title and looking closely at the painting, there is actually no gray, so don't worry. The painting is in the Art Institute of Chicago um, up the road, but you have another relatively similar um, Mondrian painting in St. Louis Art Museum. Okay. Before we jump in to what this painting means, the first thing we have to do is take it seriously as a thing. We want to give it consideration as an object because part of honoring um, the incarnation, part of honoring our own embodiment and the goodness of the created world is to take the material stuff of an artwork seriously and not just jump straight to interpretation. So this means that we have to grapple with this painting as an actual object, a thing in space. We should consider how it was made, what it was made from. Um, artwork is not merely an illustration of an idea. The, the late Tim Keller suggests that if an artwork is getting its meaning across in a way that is too apparent, then it's really preaching rather than art, and I agree with him in that. We cannot simply substitute Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son for theological commentary, right? Instead, we really must, as C.S. Lewis says, surrender to the object itself. So in art history, we call this practice visual analysis. And to analyze something is to break it down into smaller parts so that we understand how those parts work together, right? So we understand how a bicycle functions or how a flower is pollinated by looking at the individual pieces and learning what they do in relationship to each other. And that's what we can do with artworks as well. So when we look at lozenge composition with yellow, black, blue, red, and not gray, here's what we see. Right? We're, we're looking at a, an almost two foot square painting rotated 45 degrees so that it hangs like a diamond, like a lozenge on the wall. And there's this irregular grid composed of perfectly straight, vertical, and horizontal black lines that divides that white composition, resulting in truncated rectangles and the occasional triangle. Mondrian fills in some of these shapes with flat color, either black, yellow, red, or blue. And the painting might seem almost childlike in its simplicity, but really, I'm going to argue that Mondrian is creating unity and balance using the formal elements of line, shape, and color in ways that are deceptively complex. So his network of lines both unites and divides the composition. Those narrow black lines are less than an inch wide and they contrast sharply with this pure white background. 
But while the lines are all the same width and color, they're irregularly spaced across the canvas, and they interact with in, in different ways with the canvas as a whole, creating variety even within unity. So the shape and the orientation of the canvas, the way that it's turned like this, functions as part of this whole network of shapes. Likewise, the colors may seem really simple, but Mondrian's strategic application of them pulls the painting together in, I think, surprising ways. So look at the black rectangle on the left. Do you see how that is visually heavy, how it sort of sucks in light and, and kind of weighs that down a little bit? But that weight is countered by other hues, like the sunny yellow triangle that's perched on top of the black, and it's almost like a balloon, a little helium balloon that's sort of pulling that black up. Or there's this tiny scarlet triangle along the bottom left edge of the painting. And to me, that's this little dash of hot sauce, you know, sort of warming and balancing this otherwise cooler um, composition and that larger cobalt shape on the right. So together and in careful proportion, the colors maintain a sort of buzzing energy of carefully balanced forces. So if we keep looking curiously, asking more questions about what we can learn from this artwork, we might ask, how does, this, how does this make meaning, right? What is this artwork actually doing? We might have been taught that an artwork's meaning is like a little golden nugget that's locked inside of the artwork, and if we just had the right key or code, we could unlock the painting, we could unlock the sculpture, and we'd find meaning sitting inside of it. Um, but here's the thing, our commitment to embodied looking means that we have to take three things seriously. We need to take the artwork seriously, which we just did, the artist, which we'll do in a second, and we also have to take ourselves, the viewers, seriously. And the reason for this is because, I know this may come as a shock to some of you, but we are not eyeballs on sticks. Right? We're not just a, a floating eyeball that's in a vacuum, but we instead come to artworks with our whole bodies and with our whole histories as part of the, the matrix through which we understand something. God made us creatures bound by time and place, and he called that good. And so acknowledging our own finitude, um, our own embodiment, when we're looking at art, means paying attention to what we bring with us. And so I call this, um, in, in my teaching, in the book, I, I, I call this our archive, that all of us have this filing cabinet, or if you're younger, it's an algorithm, guys, um, but you have a filing cabinet in your head of all of the things that you've seen before. And you might not be able to remember them, you might not be able to name them, but they're sort of like these folders full of images that help you make sense of new information. You categorize new things according to old things that you've seen, whether by similarity or through contrast. So what do we bring with us when we look at this painting? Um, what does it remind us of, right? Well, maybe it reminds you of like a patchwork quilt block, maybe a geometric puzzle for toddlers, maybe kids building toys, maybe um, there's a, a kind of brightness and, and simplicity that maybe speaks of something childlike, something that's a little bit playful. But we might also have associations with modernist architecture and design, the facade of a modern skyscraper, um, maybe <laughs> this very literal interpretation on a hair care product, um, or like your shelves from Ikea, right? Like there's all of these, these other kinds of associations that we might have in our head. And, and we might even, this, these associations might be part of why we don't like the painting, because we might think, well, it's so simple, it is as if a kid could make it. Maybe you have said that about an artwork that you've seen in that section of the museum before. <laughs> But acknowledging our archive, acknowledging the, the ways that we almost unthinkingly categorize and respond to this work doesn't form the basis of our engagement with it, but it does provide us to, uh, with a starting point for asking better questions about the artist's embodiment. 
to sort of say, here's what I'm bringing. Now let me, let me see truly what you are bringing um, as, as the artist. So what was Mondrian's context when he made this painting in 1923? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Pete Mondrian did not start out as an abstract painter. He was a, a Dutch artist trained at the Academy of Fine Arts in Amsterdam, where he painted mostly representational landscapes. And then as a young man, he became interested in theosophy, um, a spiritualist movement that mixed elements of Buddhism, Hinduism, ancient Greek philosophy, and modern science, which sounds very fun. And theosophists emphasized the inadequacy of modern science to comprehend reality and said, instead, we can build off of science, but we need something more to obtain this spiritual truth. So for Mondrian, this had clear implications for his painting practice because it meant that rather than replicating observed reality, he wanted to seek out the most fundamental, the most elementary forms that could be understood as sort of building blocks for the whole entire universe. He's literally looking for the, co the lowest common denominator. And so from 1909 to 1914, Mondrian's paintings get increasingly um, more and more abstract. They're moving away from representation. He abstracted from nature until his paintings were only formal elements. Right? In 1917, while most of Europe was suffering tragic loss of life and property um, and infrastructure during World War I, Mondrian co-founded the art movement De Stijl, which cleverly means the style in Dutch. And it was an artistic movement that proposed a single aesthetic that would unify the arts of painting, sculpture, and architecture. So rather than making artworks that emphasize individual or national styles, the style artists wanted to make art, buildings, and even furniture that drew from the most fundamental formal elements. And you um, in the St. Louis Art Museum have a, a version of that chair that I'm showing on the far right as well. So further, De Stijl members believed that all of arts should be integrated, that they should create a harmonized environment where people could connect to this new universal consciousness. And you might imagine that in the wake of the devastation of World War I, the need for a unifying force was deeply felt um, by many. So De Stijl artists were utopian. They believed that this new universal aesthetic of straight lines, primary hues, um, black, white, and gray, that this could bring about a harmonious post-war life. And art and life could merge together into this total satisfactory whole. What would this perfect world look like? Well, to Mondrian, it would look something like this. Beginning in 1919, he started painting his studio walls white and began hanging rectangular colored panels next to and behind his geometric paintings. The living space and artworks become extensions of each other. Meanwhile, his colleague at Ritfield designed a whole home around these same principles of integrated universality. They were convinced that the right kind of design, the right kind of art, could solve all of humanity's problems. So whether or not we like the stark geometry and colors of Mondrian's painting, where does a loving look lead us here? Although Mondrian was influenced by theosophy, there's, there are ways that his work should still really resonate with a Christian understanding of the world. For example, he, the, the, the heart of the Gestalt movement is the recognition that we are more than material, right? And, and that's an insight that we share with him, that we are not just material. Furthermore, Gestalt artists acknowledge the, the brokenness of relationships, the need for some sort of reconciliation to happen. And while their work directly responds to the trauma of World War I, we can see how that conflict is just one manifestation of the rupture between ourselves, our environment, and our God that is part of the fall. But loving vision does go hand in hand with seeking truth. So while Mondrian might identify some of the same problems that Christians recognize in the world today, he's proposing a different solution, right? His savior is the spirituality of abstract or non-objective art. 
He's claiming that the erasure of individual distinctiveness can provide the path to a utopian future. If everything sort of looks the same, then that's how we're all going to be unified. We might see him demanding that people become more like him in order to achieve this paradise on earth. And that's a really different vision of paradise than what scripture gives us in Revelation 7, 9, right? Where John sees a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number standing before the throne, before the Lamb. Because the God who commanded humans to be fruitful and to multiply while cultivating the earth welcomes a diversity of people into his heavenly throne room. In a mysterious fashion, God chooses to work within the particularities of human culture. Jesus is incarnate in Roman-occupied Palestine. He speaks and he dresses and he eats and he teaches within the boundaries and rhythms of that culture while proclaiming simultaneously good news for all people. And later, the Apostle Paul extends this remarkable tension when he uses the language and structure of Greek philosophy to explain gospel truths to people around the Mediterranean. So if Mondrian gets all of this wrong, then how does transforming vision work here? How can we be open to necessary change, not by becoming more like Mondrian, but learning from him? In this, Mondrian's painting can reveal something of our own idolatrous desire to refashion the world according to what we think is pleasing. What happens if rather than critiquing Mondrian from a distance, we turn his work like a mirror on ourselves? Because how often do we think that the world would be a better place if everyone just agreed with our particular notion of beauty hard work, justice, prosperity, and the like. How much easier would everything be if we all spoke the same language, had the same sense of humor, liked the same music? Would in our churches be more pure, more effective, more efficient, more peaceful if everyone shared the same ministry commitments and budgeting priorities and worship liturgies and cultural engagement as me? We have a friend who's writing a book about disagreeing well, but that's not what Mondrian is doing. <laughs> Redeeming vision allows us to respond to Mondrian's painting, not simply with criticism, but with something new, a recognition and confession of our own idolatry of self. Because Mondrian's desire for a harmonious world echoes the very human longing for right relationships to be restored but his efforts at a universal aesthetic confuse human distinctiveness with the source of our trouble. But here's, here's my favorite part about this whole painting, this little bit right here. Because when we look closely, we can see that not even Mondrian can remove all of his humanity from his work. In this composition with yellow, black, blue, red, and gray, we find the tiniest little wobbles of black lines and these repainted sections along the edges where he seems to have changed his mind about whether or not he wanted that black line to go all the way to the edge. So despite his claim to universality, the painting bears the mark of the particular. Mondrian cannot escape his own creatureliness. So do you, do you see what we did? Wasn't that fun? We engaged the work on its own terms as a physical object made by a particular artist at a particular time and place and culture while acknowledging our own finitude as viewers. And then we looked lovingly, anticipating that we might still find something that resonates in, with us in this unexpected place. And finally, we anticipated our own transformation, acknowledging that while we might not agree with Mondrian's vision of the good life, we might actually be more like him than we'd care to commit, uh, to admit. And so we do, in fact, need to confess. Okay, but maybe Lazarus' composition wasn't that hard for you. Maybe you've already read the book. Maybe you hadn't looked at it in quite that way, but you expect even relish artworks that challenge you intellectually or propose some sort of bold cultural or social change. And if that's the case, then Thomas Dewing's Lady in White is more the kind of art that you dislike. 
this one. I went to see her in the St. Louis Art Museum today, and I still didn't really like her a whole lot. <laughs> it's, and it's, it's not that we find doing devoid of skill, right? In this small, tonal oil painting, we can see how he's doing a good job as an artist. He is using shape and value to create a balanced composition. He is using color to unify the whole. We see a dark-haired woman in a white dress seated on a dark wood and upholstered chair. She's in profile. She's looking off to the right of the composition, resting her hands on the arm of the and carved finial of the chair, seemingly unaware of our presence. Her body creates a triangular composition, right? Her head is the apex. The slope of her nose, her breast, and her full skirt form one, uh, the right slope. And then on the left-hand side of the composition, her arm juts out a bit behind her body, pushing back further in the chair and mirroring the angle of her chest. And so the overall effect is one of stability, of, of balance. The composition is still and grounded as her body is in the chair. Now, Dewing also balances this painting through value, through his careful use of light and dark. So the inky shadows in the bottom of the, the left corner, again, provide a kind of visual weight that's buoyed on the other side by her voluminous white skirt. And I, I really like this little puzzle right here. There's a, a triangle of her dark hair, and then that, in turn, is balanced by the triangle of her face and her neck and her, um, and her breasts. The warm yellow-green that suffuses the composition does the work of unifying sitter and space. And then that particular citron color on the upper right background is echoed precisely in the upholstery of the chair. The darker olive tones behind her are used to articulate the shadows of her dress. So, like, truly, what's not to like about this painting? It's pretty, it's quiet, it's skillfully done. But yes, some of us, myself included, may persist in looking down our noses at something that seems so banal. After all, what do we bring with us to this? Well, while its finish might be a little bit looser, it resembles any other, um, any number of other paintings that we may be seen before of beautiful women in beautiful dresses. It might remind us of fashion photography from the 1950s, sort of evoking um, Hollywood glamour or British royalty. And we know seemingly on intuition that this is what a beautiful woman looks like, right? This is how a beautiful woman behaves. She's slender, she's composed, she's elegant, she's languid. So that's, I think, what we bring with us um, to this painting. What do we need to know about the artist? What do we need to know about do, doing and his embodiment? Well, Thomas Wilmer Doing was a late 19th and early 20th century American painter from Boston who trained in Paris and then came back and established himself as a painter of aristocratic women. But rather than making portraits, rather than making paintings of specific women, Dewey really builds his, his reputation on these depictions of women in increasingly soft, dreamlike settings, um, in, in these interiors where they're almost always sitting. Sometimes they're playing instruments, sometimes they're reading or writing letters. A lot of the time they're just sitting. <laughs> Um, in silence, maybe listening to someone else singing or playing or talking to them. Doing was associated with a group of painters known as the tonalists, and most tonalist painters were landscape painters who used an overall color and overall hue to sort of unify the composition as a whole, but, but Doing um, appropriates, that, appropriates that and uses this in his paintings of women instead. The other thing we might need to know about doing um, is some scholars have argued that like all repeated and circulated images, doing's women cannot simply be understood as just pretty pictures, free from social implications. The art historian Kathleen Pine, for example, observes that doing's contemporaries described his women as, quote, civilized, refined, and intellectual. 
She goes on to contend that doings women embodied the newly popular notion of evolutionary progress. So with their regal profiles, contained bodies, and contemplative postures, they embodied civilization as opposed to a kind of animalism. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, as Catholic, Jewish, and Eastern European immigrants increased in the United States and new money industrialists climbed society's ladders, doings decidedly Anglo-American women draped like Grecian goddesses and Renaissance muses, sort of asserted the importance of old values, cleverly represented as progress in the face of tremendous cultural change. Does that make sense? So, so Dewing certainly wasn't the only American male painter using women as a symbol of national identity and social ideals at this time. He's really participating in a much broader trend. And so now we're, we're starting to circle more around why I disliked this image in graduate school. I was mostly fine with its form, bored by its content, but really enraged by its use, right? Doing was everything that I disliked about white male American painters from the 19th century. He used women's bodies as a means of securing and perpetuating his own social dominance. He praised a very specific, narrow type of women, ignoring the active bodies of female immigrants, factory workers, entrepreneurs, and suffragettes. Fundamentally, his work is a limitation of, rather than celebration of, the dignity of image bearing. So I felt really justified in not liking this painting too, because I could even contend that a loving look for other women demands that I not like Dewing's painting. I can talk myself into a lot of things. <laughs> but what does it mean to be open to transformation here? How can we possibly be transformed or grow in our love for God by looking at this especially when we know its negative effects historically. Well, just like we did with Mondrian's painting, what happens when I hold doing up as a mirror rather than as a subject of simple condemnation? Well, if, again, I'm honest, another reason that I don't like doing's paintings is because even though I knew everything wrong about it, I still kind of want to be that woman. I, I want people to find me beautiful and intellectual, unproblematic, moral, right? I want the strange authority that that would confer. And perhaps some of my anger stems from knowing that the body that I have, half Japanese with big cheeks and mismatched eyes, doesn't occupy that place in our visual archive. The body that I have will never be that woman. And there's more, because the more I think about it, the more I realize that I, like doing, also do want to tell stories that help reassure me that my friends and I are good, that we're the thoughtful and refined ones who are making important progress. And often I would rather protect those stories than be confronted with the people who have been left out or diminished. I would rather insist that the status quo is beautiful, that we are moving towards civilization without the discomfort of rupture, than I would prefer to actively address my addiction to control. I may not be at the top of the current social hierarchy, but I'm pretty high up, and at least I know where I fit, right? And so that's the heart of the matter, is that I don't actually believe in God's abundance because preserving or justifying the status quo or an imagined soft focus past is a means of conserving the authority or goodness I think I have. If I assume scarcity, then I will do everything in my power to protect what I currently possess. And ultimately, that's where my dislike of doing's painting directs me to, my own sort of faithless scrounging. And then, in grace, to a God who offers so much more than that. That's why I don't like doing, and that's why I need Thomas doing in my life as well. 
Now, I admit you might be thinking, really, all of that? <laughs> and maybe also, that sounds like a real bummer of a way to look at art. <laughs> You're just looking for what you're doing wrong, right? Like, shouldn't art be an escape into beauty? Why are you making all of this about confession and sin? And I want to be clear that I don't do this with every single artwork or image that I engage with. Praise God. <laughs> we can talk about some very practical strategies for engaging with the glut of images that we see every day or the things that we encounter when we walk through an art museum. But, but here's the thing. Because I actually do walk in abundance, anticipating God's restorative work, these self-realizations and moments of confession are just more moments, truly, for grace to abound. This is that transforming vision that I was talking about, that if we are looking to learn something of ourselves, to be generative rather than to merely deconstruct, so many more objects actually open up to us. Dorothea Lange's migrant mother has challenged my assumptions about what the deserving poor look like. Carrie Mae Weems's photo and text installations have been a call to me to confess my ignorance or perpetuation um, of untrue stories of race and history. Donatello's Madonna, um, sorry, Mary Magdalene, asked me to acknowledge my own finitude. Mark Rothko's color field paintings have really challenged me to be still. Adele Libby Guillard's self-portrait with two pupils has poked at my own self-carefully constructed persona in ways that I find deeply uncomfortable. And Eva Hesse's ephemeral latex and fiberglass sculptures that change over time have challenged my own desire for control. And I confess, God, I don't see as I ought. And when I do that, my love for God can grow as I marvel that actually he is the one who sees me. This is Elroy, the God who sees. God who sees Hagar, desperate and desolate in the wilderness, and he moves towards her in love, addressing her unspoken fear for her unborn child, promising her a future that must have seemed unimaginable to an enslaved woman. And Hagar is transformed by that encounter. She is changed so thoroughly that she literally repents, right? She turns around and she heads back to Abram and to Sarai. What causes that radical alteration? It's God seeing her that changes everything. The God of the universe gazes upon Hagar with deep love and creative attention. He sees what does not yet exist, and he offers this to Hagar. And renewed by this knowledge that she is regarded and cared for, Hagar steps into obedience, confident that her longings will be fulfilled. And so this is redeeming vision, looking as a creature embodied, formed by love and in need of transformation. Our looking can be generative, making something new from the abundance of grace that we already inhabit, even and especially when it's the art we don't like. We can look at Piet Mondrian's abstract painting and respond with confession, acknowledging the ways that we want to remake the world according to our rules and ignoring the gifts of our neighbors in favor of our own notions of perfection. And we can engage Thomas Dewing's Lady in White, perhaps repenting of our per preservation of an unjust present in order to maintain some kind of security for ourselves rather than trusting God to freely give. Both artworks can prompt, in different ways, growth of our love for God, who sees and, I, and transforms us. And that's my invitation to you tonight. Thank you. Hello. Hello. We have a few questions from the audience. Great. Uh, okay. This involves Bob Ross and Thomas Kincaid. Okay. Is it okay to say that I like Tom and Mark 
or bad art or say that I don't like good art? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> I, 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 I think about engaging art as similar to, in some ways, very similar to eating food and in some ways very similar to engaging with people. <laughs> um, and when you are, are thinking about art as uh, akin to eating food, it would, be, it would behoove you to not have a diet of just one thing, right? Like, even if that one thing is carrots, you probably shouldn't just eat carrots. You should have some sort of variety in your diet. Um, some things that are maybe a little bit harder to digest than others are good for your body. Um, and so I, I think there is um, ways that we need to be maybe a little bit more thoughtful about the kind of image diets that we are on. And we live in a world that is so image driven that you might not even realize that you have an image diet. Um, something that I, I challenge some of my students to do on occasion is to actually try to keep just a one day journal where you're just tallying all of the images that you see and where you see them. Um, so you pay attention to how much you are looking at and can be more, more thoughtful about it. Um, and so I look at art that makes me happy. I like looking, I like looking at Dutch still life paintings. Those make me happy. <laughs> But I also don't want to only look at Dutch still life paintings. Um, I think, and, I, and I, I love Bob Ross for how he sort of democratizes and makes accessible the idea that like you can make art in your home and in your living room and that the trees should make you happy. Like that's great, we love that. Um, Thomas Kincaid is a little harder for me. <laughs> in, in part because he himself claimed that he was painting what the world would have looked like without a fall. And, and theologically, I have a, a problem with that um, because I, I think that, that that's a really bold statement to make. Um, I think that that pokes at God's sovereignty, at God's plan from creation. And a world without the fall also means that's a, a world that that doesn't need Jesus, that doesn't have Jesus. Um, and I, I find that to actually end up being fairly dark. Um, that said, love a good purple tree every now and then, you know? But maybe you could find paintings that are like Thomas Kincaid's paintings, but aren't claiming to be the world before the fall. Great, thank you. Uh, what are some of your strategies or playful methodologies for visiting an art museum? Thank you for asking that question. I love talking about this. I have a few. So one strategy that I really like when you're going to an art museum, and I would, say, I would say that there are different strategies if you're visiting your hometown museum versus if you're visiting a museum that, that is in a city that you are, are just there for a little while. If you're going to a museum that is in a, in a city that you are visiting, if you're going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, if you're going to the MFA in Houston, I, I do think that it's a good idea to do a little bit of research ahead of time and to just try to look on their website, see what the museum is really excited about having, um, because anything, anything that the museum is really excited about having, they will usually also have seating in front of. And so if you need to build in like a sitting break to your art visit, that's a good way to do it. So that's, that's one way is to sort of see what does the, what does the museum want me to see? And I'll, I'll play along with that. Because oftentimes they'll also have the best interpretive materials that go along with the things that they are excited to share with you. But if I'm going to my hometown museum or if I'm taking my kids to a museum, um, some of the things that we do are go on a color walk through the museum. So we'll find a very specific color, a very particular shade of pink or green. And then we will try to find that color everywhere else in the museum that we can. And it sounds really silly and it sounds like you're not actually looking at the art, but you're gonna look at the art so much more closely instead of at the placards. <laughs> 
um, because you're going to be looking for this thing. It makes you attentive to something small um, and helps you be able to kind of focus in a little bit more. And you'll be surprised by where those colors show up. Um, you'll be surprised by certain colors that disappear in certain historical eras and then come back later. Um, there's, there's all kinds of, of ways that you can make meaning from the where you're finding those colors. Another thing I like to do um, is to challenge myself to go to the part of the museum that I wouldn't normally gravitate towards. Um, so the last time that I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I went to their Islamic co collection because that's not usually a part of the museum that I end up in um, and just dedicated some time there and ended up being so delighted by places of connection that I wasn't expecting to find just by putting myself into sort of a new situation. And then a third way that I like to visit museums um, is to do a really quick zip through a few galleries and then just try to pay attention to, to my to my gut, honestly, like what is what are two things? I want to find one thing that I really like and want to come back to, and I want to find one thing that I'm having a negative response to and come back to that as well. The stuff that isn't really doing either of those, we say hi, but then we just keep going. And I then I'll go back to the thing that I really like and try to figure out why I really like it, spend more time doing this kind of closer analysis. And then I'll go to the thing that I didn't like and spend some time trying to do the same thing there. But that's a lot more manageable than trying to do this with every single thing that you see in an art museum, which would be absolutely impossible. So those are some of my favorite strategies for, for visiting an art museum. Great. We've had a couple along these lines, so I'm kind of sitting inside here, but can or should we learn about God from all art? What about Hitler's paintings? Are there any lines that we should not cross in our engagement with art, and how do we know that? Mm -hmm. I think often Christians want sets of guardrails when we're engaging with all kinds of culture, not just visual art, but music, with literature, um, philosophy, strangely not as often with science, but we want, we want guardrails. And, and part of what I argue in my, in my book is that the Bible doesn't so much give us guardrails for looking at art as it gives us a path to follow. And so if we are following this path of, of faithfully pursuing love of God and love of neighbor, then that is going to direct the kinds of things that we choose to give our time to, choose to give our attention to. The, the question of can we learn from art made by Hitler or the art that Hitler collected? I think it was made by Hitler. I mean, that's not a very good painting. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably find other things to look at. <laughs> um, I, would be, I, I would genuinely actually be more interested in looking at the art that Hitler collected and what it says about his underlying motivations of this, this world that he's trying to build for himself. Um, and like the Thomas doing, or, or, or even the Mondrian, what are places that the world I'm trying to build for myself might sometimes line up in, in very uncomfortable ways. I want to say, in terms of content, I don't think that you should look at anything that violates your conscience. I don't want to make you think that you need to go into the art museum and that you have to look at a, a photograph of someone defecating if that is going to violate your conscience. Don't do that, please. Like The Holy Spirit has a role to play here as well. Um, but I think oftentimes the art that we, and you'll hear stories of this crazy contemporary art um, that's meant to be offensive, and that'll be the stuff that goes viral and that, that makes the news. You don't have to pay attention to that, but pay attention to the things in the museum that you're not sure why they are upsetting you, right? That make you, that have just that, that bit of friction, that's, that's, those are the ones that are worth going back to. Um, but again, just like with eating food, um, <sighs> If you really don't like Brussels sprouts, you're probably going to be okay, like not eating Brussels sprouts. You can try broccoli instead, you know? Like do something else that challenges you. That would be okay. Okay, we did have a request. Can you do the Peabody part of the talk now? <laughs> 
We can do a truncated version. Yes. <laughs> we have 10 minutes. Can we do it in that? Yes. <laughs> Except I'm going to have to break my rule and not let you look at it for as long as I would want you to. Okay. This is Kiki Smith's Peabody. It is a life-sized wax sculpture of a woman crouching near the ground, and there are these strands of yellow glass beads um, on the ground below her, as if they forming something akin to, to pools of urine. Um, Kiki Smith was, well, actually, where might this come in your archive? Um, a lot of this is through contrast. These are, this is not the body that we expect to see in an art museum. We expect to see female bodies that are beautiful and idealized and polished. Um, you know, there's examples in SLAM, in the Mildred Lane Kemper Museum, um, of bodies that are in almost the exact same pose. This is Harriet Hosmer's um, sculpture here, but where Hosmer's Sculpture is a sort of dream. Kiki Smith is a nightmare, right? Um, well, who was Kiki Smith? She was an artist working in New York um, in the 1990s. She's continuing to make work to this day. But in the 90s, she was really focused on um, the, the sort of inner workings of the body. She took a class as an EMT because she wanted to better understand how our bodies functioned and made a lot of, I think, really beautiful artwork of internal organs playing with materials and how the material and the function of that organ um, might work in different ways. And she's also making all this work. Um, the, the Peabody sculpture is one of a, of a number of sort of leaking bodies that she makes in the early 90s, which means that she's making them in the middle of the culture wars and in, during the HIV AIDS crisis. And so even though she's not necessarily making work about AIDS, the, the, the sort of politicization of the body in the late 80s and early 90s is definitely part of how her work is being understood and maybe can help account for, for folks' really viscerally negative reactions to a lot of things that she was making. And then one more thing you should know about her is that she was um, raised Catholic. Her mother was Catholic and she often would talk about, has, has spoken frequently about how um, she was, was sort of fascinated by the ways that um, faithful Catholics might punish their bodies, but also be so interested in bodily fluids like blood and the milk of the Virgin Mary, um, and interested in transformation that the, the, the host and the wine in the Eucharist become the literal body and blood of Christ. And so she credits a lot of her interest in the body as coming from that Catholic imagination. The reason I was going to talk to you about this one is that I actually saw it. It's not, it's in the Harvard um, Art Museum's collection, but I saw it for the first time when I was a graduate student, when it was on display at the Pulitzer Foundation. So if you know that stairwell, um, that's where I saw it. And I was there on a visit with my cohort and <laughs> because it's on this staircase, any time that you walked out of any other room, you just saw this body hovering in the corner of your eye. And it was really disruptive because I just was, I was thinking I was gonna have a very intellectual kind of engagement with art that day. And instead there kept being this woman crouching in the corner out of the, you know, just in your peripheral vision. And you sort of wanted to be like, go over to her and say, not here. I was like, we don't do this here, but also, are you okay? Like, you don't look okay. Are you, are you going to be okay? Um, and, and I think that part of my discomfort with Peabody originally um, was that she sort of showed up in a place that I didn't expect her to be, um, but also because her body was more, if Thomas Dewing's body isn't like mine, this one is more like mine than I would prefer it to be. I want to be clear that I have never urinated in an art museum before. <laughs> However, I, I have experienced my body feeling like it's falling apart in this really sort of public, uncontrollable way, whether it be because of emotion or because I was pregnant <laughs> or something. Um, I have felt the sort of shame of a body in the doctor's office after you've peed in that little cup and are waiting for some sort of news to come from that. And a lot of my shame over sort of vicarious shame from this body 
is because I would prefer to live without limits. Um, and a fuller, a fuller understanding of the incarnation for me has been so humbling to really think about the, the word becoming flesh, born of a woman, yes, eating and sleeping and drinking, but also smelling and passing waste. And I don't, I don't say that to be blasphemous. I say that to say like, Jesus meets us here in these bodies and he promises to resurrect and to restore these bodies. And so when I despise Peabody, when I despise my body, I, I, I am also despising the body of Christ. And I don't wanna do that. And I need to confess that. And that's where Kiki Smith keeps bringing me back to saying, um, this is, this is a broken body, and this is the body that makes me long for resurrection even more. That's why I don't like it and why I love it. Thank you. Let's thank